And they work very hard to do that. So if you actually, if you increase expenditure, you increase hunger. And if you don't eat more, what you'll find, what you'll find with animals is animals that are forced to work out will expend less energy at the times they're not working out. So they'll still balance. They won't actually expend more energy. They'll expend more energy while they're on the treadmill. And while they're off the treadmill, they won't move and they'll sleep longer. So everything actually is dependent on everything else. And this is why diets don't work. And this is why exercise doesn't work. Because when you try to cut calories, this is how, well, Jeff Flyer and Terry Meritus. Jeff is now dean at Harvard Law Medical School. And Terry Meritus Flyer is his wife. They both do obesity research. They had an article in Scientific American. They were talking about eating less. So they say an animal whose food is suddenly restricted, and you can't just tell an animal to eat less, like go on a diet, you're a fat rat. You actually have to, you just can't let it have food available. So an animal whose food is suddenly restricted tends to reduce its energy expenditure, both by being less active and by slowing energy use in cells, thereby limiting weight loss. And then it also increases hunger. So if you reduce E in up there, E out gets smaller. Not only does the animal not want to exercise, but it actually expends less energy. If you restrict its calories enough, its body temperature goes down. Um, and what's fascinating is this was actually shown in humans as early as 1917 that if you put someone on a diet, a calorie restricted diet, their metabolism slows down, their body temperature drops, they become sedentary and lazy, they lose their sex drive. And what I'm curious about is why the flyers said an animal whose food is restricted, because it had been shown by humans time and time again. But if they had shown a human, they had said a human, it would have been obvious why diets don't work, and either they or the um, editors of the magazine didn't want anyone to see that. So, now that I've put all the problems with this calories in, calories out nonsense, let me give you the flip side. I could actually, in this case, I can give you the alternative hypothesis. This is how the Europeans thought about this problem. So they said, they started with first principles, okay? So remember I said like obesity research today will say obesity is a disorder of energy balance which assumes that it's all about taking in more calories than you expend. They, these guys started from the, the point of view of obesity is a disorder of excess fat accumulation. So that's like saying having too much fat is a disorder of having too much fat. It's the simplest possible thing you could say about the statement. So it's not energy balance, it's not overeating, it's not sedentary behavior, it's just too much fat. And then what you want to know is what regulates the fat tissue, and we'll get to that. And then overeating and inactivity are compensatory effects, they're not causes. So what I mean is, if we have some regulatory problem that increases our fat accumulation, delta E, remember I said if something mass increase in the system that has to take in more energy than it expends. So if you increase delta E, if you're getting fatter, you're either going to have to eat more or expend less energy. So gluttony or sloth, overeating or sedentary behavior are going to be side effects. And the way this was phrased to me first by a University of Massachusetts research, we said, we don't get fat because we overeat. We overeat because our fat tissue is accumulating excess fat. So to show that this isn't some rhetorical game I'm playing, I want to just give you some examples. This is the kind of example these pre-World War II Europeans used. This particularly cute child, um, good friend of mine, even though his mother's mad at me because his father is giving a talk in Walnut Creek on a Saturday when he could be <laughs> home with the kids. 2006, one years old. I mean, have you ever seen such a cute baby? <laughs> um, he weighed 20 pounds. 2009, three years later, he weighs 45 pounds, okay? So this, he's gained 25 pounds in three years. He has overeaten, right? He's taken in more calories than he expended. But he, and he grew. But he didn't grow because he overate. He overate because he was growing. Okay, the causality is reverse. Growth was the cause, overeating is the effect. And he was growing because he was secreting growth hormone. Okay, and we all know when kids grow, when they go through growth spurts, you know, they, they get tired, they lie around, they sit around the house all day long, they eat voraciously, you're eating me out of house and home. And the reason they're eating so much and the reason they're lying around the, you know, the house all day long is because they're growing. They're not growing because they're in positive energy balance. Here's another particularly gruesome example. Um, cancer, okay, if you can see on the right, here's a tumor cell, and you can see it growing on day 10, day 20, day 30. This tumor is in positive energy balance. It's growing, it's gotta be. It's taking in more calories than it expends. 
And nobody in the obesity research community, I mean the cancer research community, cares. Well, you know, of course it's in positive energy balance. It's growing. It's got to be. What you want to know is what's driving it to grow. What genes are broken? What signaling molecules are out of whack? What hormonal signals is it taking that's driving it to grow? Because if we can identify those, we can stop its growth. It is true that if we starve it, we might also be able to stop its growth, just like we could starve a child and stunt its growth. But it's not growing because it's in positive energy balance. It's in positive energy balance because it's growing. So here's the theory. This was known as the lipophilia theory of obesity, OK? It was a German-Austrian hypothesis prior to the Second World War. The leading proponents were this guy, Gustav von Bergmann, who was the leading expert in internal medicine in Germany in the first half of the 20th century. And today, the highest award given by the German Society of Internal Medicine is the Gustav von Bergmann Award. And Julius Bauer was a professor of genetics and endocrinology, which is hormones, at the University of Vienna. He was very famous. I mean, if you find a, an Austrian biologist today, he will remember Julius Bauer. Um, they weren't fly-by-night quacks. They weren't diet doctors. And their theory was more or less fully accepted in Europe by 1940. And the problem, like I said, is 1940 was a very bad year for Europe. And they vanished. Actually, Bauer ended up coming to the U.S. in 1938 when the Nazis invaded Austria, um, lived in New Orleans for a year, then ended up in L.A. and would write papers in, that would get published in the medical journals, Julius Bauer, Hollywood, California, not like Julius Bauer, professor of something or other. And his son actually ended up being the, the dean of the med school at USC. But just once he got here, people stopped paying attention because nobody cared what he had to say. So lipophilia means love of fat. And what their theory was is that some tissues like to accumulate fat and other tissues don't, and some people like to accumulate fat and other people don't. And the example they used was like hair. They said just we grow hair in some places and not others, you know. Some people have hair on their chest, some people don't. We get fat in some places and not others. You know, like you don't get fat on your forehead. You don't get fat usually on the back of your hand. And some people, just some people are hairier than others, some people are fatter than others. And so what you want to know is what regulates this. Because we know with hair it's not about what you eat or how much you eat, so why should it be that way with food? So here's how Bauer put it in uh, 1929. He said, like a malignant tumor like the fetus, the uterus, or the breasts of a pregnant woman, the abnormal lipophilic tissue seizes on foodstuffs, even in the case of undernutrition. It maintains its stock and may increase it independent of the requirements of the organism. A sort of anarchy exists. The adipose tissue lives for itself and does not fit into the precisely regulated management of the whole organism. So even in the case of undernutrition, you know, we begin to explain what was happening in those populations if we see that even when people are starving, they could still actually accumulate fat because their fat tissue, just like a tumor, wants it and it's going to take it. And if you look at animal models of obesity, there's a lot of different ways that researchers have been making fat animals in the laboratories for 30 years. Um, you could remove the ovaries from rats. You can they're, they're screw with their genetics. You could study hibernators, which get you know, very fat in the fall. Um, you could lesion something called the ventromedial hypothalamus of the brain. In all these models, all these animals, what you find is what the defect does it doesn't make the animal eat too much or make it you know, lie around and want to watch television. Just like our breeding example, the defect actually makes the animal accumulate fat in its fat tissue. Like this fellow George Wade I mentioned earlier, he, studied, he was studying animal reproduction. He wanted to know why animals gain weight when they get pregnant. Like female animals when they get pregnant put on fat just like you know, humans do. And he wanted to know why, so he did these experiments where he removed the ovaries from the rats. And he noticed that the rats get very fat very quickly. They, they eat voraciously and they get fat. And um, what's happening basically is you're removing the estrogen. Because if you get rid of the estrogen, if you put the estrogen back, the animal doesn't get fat. It doesn't eat voraciously. And he said, if you just do that experiment, you might think removing the estrogen makes the animal want to eat a lot because it's got this incredible appetite. But then he did the same experiment where he removed the ovaries, but he put the animals on a diet from the moment they came out of surgery where they couldn't eat any more than they used to eat. And they got just as fat as they ever did, just as quickly. Didn't matter if they ate voraciously or not, 
they got fat, but in the second case, they were completely sedentary. The animals wouldn't move at all. In fact, they'd only move if there was food that they had to crawl to. And he said, if you just did the second experiment, it was though you, you know, you'd think, oh, well, I remove estrogen, I turn the animals into couch potatoes, right? But what happens is you remove the estrogen, you literally make the animal accumulate fat in its fat tissue. And he actually explained this to me. The, the, there's a, uh, an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase that sticks out of fat tissue, LPL. And what this enzyme does is it simply it pulls fat out of the circulation into the fat tissue. And estrogen suppresses this enzyme. It keeps it down. So you remove the estrogen. By the way, any women go through menopause recently? You know, sound familiar? Remove the estrogen. Lipoprotein lipase, this enzyme LPL, sprouts on the animal's fat cells. And it starts pulling in fat as fast as it can. And this is fat the animal can't use for fuel anymore because it's all getting stuck in the fat cells. So the animal has to compensate. So if there's more food to eat, it eats. It gets hungry because it's like everything it's eating is going straight into the fat. It's not going anywhere else. And if it can't eat more, it just becomes sedentary because it has less energy to expend. It doesn't go for runs or run on the treadmill because it literally doesn't have the energy to do it. So um, it was, again, weighed about these experiments. who said, you know, these animals didn't get fat because they overate. They overate because we made them fat. We changed the regulation of their fat tissue. And this fellow, Jean Mayer, was the most influential nutritionist in the United States in 1968. He studied an obese strain of fat mice, and he said these mice will make fat out of their food under the most unlikely circumstances, even when half starved. So here's the obvious questions, okay? We know when we're talking about vertical growth, growth is the cause, and overeating is the effect. Why isn't that true for horizontal growth, too? And if it's true for animals, why isn't it true for man? And then the simple question, if obesity is a, a disorder of excess fat accumulation, what regulates fat accumulation? So you're now about to learn more about fat accumulation, about four slides, than any of your doctors know. Although your doctors are actually taught this in medical school, but they never considered it relevant to why anyone gets fat. Um, I apologize for the science. <laughs>